So my name is Steve Tibbs. I'm from Southern California. Many of you, some of you have already come up to me. I'm typically known as Eve Tibbs' husband. Uh, my wife is uh, very active in the church. Uh, she's uh, uh, a professor at Fuller Seminary, uh, has her doctorate in theology, and uh, just extremely active. Now, she's got her doctorate in theology. Just a caution, I don't. Uh, what I have is some practical experience. Um, I go to uh, St. Paul's, we both go to St. Paul's Irvine. Uh, our first domino is Father Stephen Saclee, so I'm sure many of you know. And uh, it's been my absolute pleasure to uh, work with him uh, well over 20 years that it, since he's been there. Um, and learned a great deal. And it's been my honor to serve as his uh, parish council president for 14 of those 20 years. They were not consecutive, because that would violate the UPRs, right? Uh, and it wouldn't be healthy uh, to do that. So over a uh, little over 20 years at St. Paul's, I've had the opportunity to I'll lead the parish council. Uh, my current role is uh, I work with the Metropolis of San Francisco. Uh, I head the ministry, which is the Orthodox Parish Leadership, uh, focusing primarily on parish strategic planning, um, capital campaigns, uh, something that really doesn't fit, but you'll get the idea of uh, its organization development. Uh, what does that mean? It means looking at the efficiency and the, uh, the ability to uh, have a priest and a parish council work effectively as a team, and sometimes uh, go and, and do some mitigation work if they're, if they're not. Um, in addition, uh, lay leadership development as well. I just came off uh, Saturday, did a full day seminar at one of our parishes uh, with, uh, on the leadership. Um, we're developing a number of materials, a number of programs, and um, you know, our goal is to uh, develop those, road test them if you will, and then make them available really to uh, anyone that wants to access the website and so more on that as we, as we develop. Um, so it's a, been a real blessing in that role. Uh, I'm very thankful to uh, be asked to be here. Uh, what I'm gonna share with you is a number of experiences. Uh, prior, my professional life is I was a consultant, I say I still am, uh, specializing in organization change management. Uh, working with organizations to improve, again, efficiencies and uh, improve outcomes. So I've taken those business skills and put them in the context of the church, uh, which is what all of our parish council members do and ministry leaders do on a regular basis. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I don't know if Father Evan is here. I don't know if he's... Oh, there he is in the back. Uh, Father Evan set a wonderful foundation for what I'm going to be speaking about today. Uh, and absolutely, uh, I only had about a dozen times when Father I would have said, oh, okay, I was going to say that, and I was going to say that. But the nice thing about uh, instructing and giving uh, speeches is you can tell, you know, tell them, tell them what you told them, and tell them again. So now this is the tell them what you told them phase. And uh, I'll be accenting a few, few things on that. What we're going to do is we're going to start out kind of general. And then we're going to narrow it down, and we're going to crawl actually under the hood. As I mentioned, my wife's a theologian, so she is almost like the car designer, right? She can explain the aerodynamics. She can explain the engineering. I'm the mechanic. I am connecting spark plugs. And that's how I see myself in the parish as well. And when I go into parishes, I, I help with the mechanics. So I'm going to share some of those experiences. Now, I do want to say kind of a, a preface. If I mention a parish by name, uh, I have their approval to do so. I never speak out of turn. I want to respect that. Um, if I mention a priest by name, I have his approval to do that. And when I go into a parish, the first thing I do is I thank them for allowing me to learn from them, because that is what always happens. I will go and pick up experiences, and then I tell them that I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to share it with another parish. And that's an agreement that we make, and that's what I do. Uh, there's absolutely no good for me to learn things and keep it to myself. So. Just about everything that I'm gonna, uh, everything that you're gonna see today, uh, I've either learned at a parish, used, provided, uh, given to me. So it's all real life stuff, if you will. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Um, so what did Saint Demetrius, Holy Trinity, and Assumption have in common? 
If anybody can answer that, I'll give you the mic. Uh, well, they all used uh, a number of metrics and measures to really create and position themselves for transformational change. That what you saw them doing in their parish wasn't the intended outcome, but it was a piece of the outcome. So today when we're talking about metrics and measures and how those metrics and measures can influence the development of a parish, you know, either revitalization, creating health, or continuing to be healthy. In this case, St. Demetrios in the upper left has a goal. And their goal is to, they have, they're in their 100th year of their parish, and their goal is 100 by 100. And the 100 by 100 is that they want to be 100% sufficient and off the need for festivals and golf tournaments and crab feeds to pay the bills. They did that as a strategic goal for the parish to be able to sustain themselves long term, but more importantly, they recognized that their role is in outreach and that fundraising should be used to help those in need rather than pay the electric bill. That's their strategic intent. But I've got a pie chart next to that. Well, what does that mean? They simply didn't have a good handle on what their expenses were. Now, they did a budget. They reconciled. They've been around almost 100 years at that time. But they really didn't have a sense of where they were going. And so they put a lot of effort in cleaning up their data and making sure that there was a good degree of confidence in the numbers that they were creating in order to enable them to what they do, what they needed to do strategically. At Holy Trinity, uh, Holy Trinity is exceptional of telling you on any Sunday how many people are in church. They've been doing this for well over five years. And in the North Next, they've got a clipboard, and you can go through almost every month over the last five years, to by week by week. They did that as a basis of just teaching themselves uh, the discipline of counting. But that's not their strategic goal. Their strategic goal was to win back the hearts and minds of their parishioners through trust and transparency. They had some legal issues. They were public, so um, people can find out about them. They're past those issues, but they haven't gotten to the trust and transparency yet. And so while they were counting the people coming in, they were counting the decline. They could tell you how much it was dropping. And then they realized, we've got to do something to respond to that. And they studied it and realized that the leaders in the parish were not trusted. So what do they do? Well, we're in the middle of doing a strategic plan right now. And part of that strategic plan is we did a parish survey, a very full survey, uh, really asking everyone in the parish to cooperate and participate. And they did. But the key behind this and I'll have to give credit to the, the team on the, uh, that's on the ground in the strategic planning process. Um, so we need to share the results. And we did. We shared the results uh, honestly, openly. Uh, here's the pluses, here's the minuses. And a funny thing happened along the way. We did that about uh, October of this year. Uh, stewardship immediately shot up. As a matter of fact, because we think because of that, because of that demonstration of honesty and, and openness, uh, they had their highest uh, number of stewards they've ever had and the highest amount of money they've ever been given from a stewardship perspective. Coincidence? Maybe. We don't think so. We think it was the demonstration of this openness from leadership that did that. And the last one, Holy Apostles, we just finished a strategic plan up there. As an outcome of that, uh, they're launching a building program uh, under Fa Father Tom Sakalakis. However, why are they doing a building program? Well, the fundamental reason is that they want to enhance the worship experience. They're packed on Sundays. People turn around, walk back to their cars. There's simply no room at the end, if you will, to get inside the church. Now, when we set out, we didn't do a strategic plan to justify a building program. It was an outcome. And building program itself is not the goal. The goal, the enablement, if you will, is the building that will allow more people to worship. So all three of these cases where we thought we were going in one direction, it reinforced this opportunity to get much deeper. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about how we do that, how there's simple change 
and there's more difficult changes. And one of the things that Father Evans struck a chord with me last night, and oh, by the way, I, I fully appreciate the, uh, the adaptive nature of what Father Evans talked about. So, so much so that I went back and redid my slides last night. So if anybody tries to follow me in the slides, it'll be a general reference to what I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, Stacy, I apologize for that, but it's continuous improvement. Um, and of course, the nice thing is Stacy can't rebut because he can't talk. Uh, oh, there he is. So, um, when we're using metrics and measures, uh, one of the things that uh, it's, it's it, the, the first element that, that we need to talk about is that numbers aren't equal. Uh, measures aren't equal. Uh, there are measures that are used to maintain and monitor, and there are measures and metrics that are absolutely used as, that they can be a change agent. That can uh, stimulate response and activity. And for today, I'll be talking about the transactional and transformational metrics. Transactional, uh, and I don't mean to, mean to demean this at all, but it's some of the things that we talked about last night. How many weddings? Which is stewardship dollars? Which is stewardship increase? Year over year, those sort of things. So the, kind of the report card. The transformational hits much deeper. It's Holy Trinity trying to be more trusting. What do you do? How do you do that? How do you measure that? How do you measure that you're more trusting? So I'll be giving some examples of that throughout the presentation on what the difference is between the transactional and transformational. As leaders, as leaders, you acknowledge the transactional, need to have it, that's the basis, but your focus is transformation. That's what leaders do. Leaders transform, leaders lead. You lead your flocks in a transformative manner. That's how you create parish health, okay? Father Irvin yesterday talked about change management. He talked about the need to change. So I put in some slides that are not in your packet on change management. I spent 30 years in the area of change management. I just want to share some of these things. Uh, one of the first assignments I had from Metropolis of San Francisco was I was asked to lead the implementation of our strategic plan. Uh, well, Bill Marianas, who many of you know, if not all of you know, uh, came in and led the development of the plan, and then I was given this huge plan and asked to implement it every parish within the metropolis. Well, I decided not to go around parish to parish and do that, so we put together a program. First thing I did was I sat down with His Eminence, Metropolitan Yudasimos, and started to talk to him about change management and what it meant for him to be a change leader. Because leading change is different than your daily life of being a leader. There's many attributes, but it's a different context. It's a different way of thinking and approaching situations, different techniques, if you will. And about halfway through, he stopped and he said, Steve, he goes, what is change management again? And I said, it's what you're gonna be doing for the next two years. <laughs> you know, oh, okay, all right. And then we proceeded. So this is a model for change management, very simple. Fun, most fundamental definition is that you're going to move from what you know today to what you think you envision for tomorrow. So if you're looking at your parish today, hopefully when you go back to your parishes, you're going to be able to see the today, but you're going to have a desire to get to the tomorrow. You're going to have the desire to get to a healthy parish or a more healthy parish or sustained health within your parish. The challenge is it's all in your head, and you've got to get it out to your entire parish. And sometimes it's not really that, even that clear. You have this vague vision. So the challenge is, in change management, is change, is a, change management is a programmatic set of steps that's going to get you from today till tomorrow. And that, what do I do, and how do I do it? And again, the tomorrow is vague. Matter of fact, if you're in a building program, what's the first thing you do before you start your capital campaign? You have renderings. Right, you try to create this image of what we're going to create. And that, that gets modified as you're going through the development process. But the reality is, is that you've got to create this vision. Well, I show a dome here uh, moving from, you know, parish on the left to a, a, a new church. But we're going to have a dome, and it's going to look something like this. That's actually easy. 
What do you do when you go back and talk to your parish councils to say, we need to be more trusting. We need to be transformative in our decisions. We need to leave from our heart rather than our heads. And it's a little tougher. So the challenge is that you have to create this vision and time absolutely is an enemy in this process. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the, the challenges going forward of what to watch out for. Just like your parish, everybody here is at a different level. Some of you have healthy parishes. You're gonna be looking just to trim off those you know, couple of pounds before your max health. Others are definitely in need of an, imme an, imme an immediate health program. You've seen parish life cycles, right? There's many of them out there. Uh, I've got one that I use when I go to parishes. And really, parish uh, life cycles are really intended to uh, describe, get everybody on the same page about, you know, is it maturing? Is it plateauing? Is it on a decline? Is it stagnant? You know, where is your, where is your parish in, in the life cycle of its development? This is one that I use to really stimulate discussion. And you can look at this model and ask yourself, where is my parish on this model? Now, this is a little bit more of an extreme model. However, it does show and uses the word decay. With the notion of decay means an immediate response. Now, how many people, well, you don't have to actually hold up your hand, but I will. How many people have ever been on a diet in this room? All right. How many people succeeded in that diet and never put on any weight after that diet? No, I can't do that. Um, why is that? Well, because we reverted back to our old behaviors. It wasn't sustainable. And the challenge behind a, a parish also, and individuals that are looking at their own personal health, if I'm, and you know people like this, they say, oh, I'm gonna go on a diet, I'm, I'm five pounds overweight, or I'm four pounds overweight, I, I gotta get back into shape, and you kinda look at them and go, seriously? Uh, what they do is they respond right away to the signal in a very short amount of time, with some effort, they're back on goal, and they say, I did it. But what happens if that person says, I'm 50 pounds overweight? How long is it gonna take that person to get back into shape? What's the level of effort that it's going to take? And does that person have behaviors that are gonna be even harder to change? Your parish, you have to ask yourself, are we two pounds overweight? And I wanna respond and get us back into shape and actually get us in better condition? Or is my parish 50 pounds overweight and it's gonna take a level of effort that I don't even know yet? That's what this chart demonstrates. And to what Father Everett said last night, as you can see, there's methods and structures and getting out the old, just like when you're dieting. You're, you're adopting a new set of behaviors and a new, new lifestyle. And that's what parishes do as well. They adopt a new lifestyle. But something along the way happens. And the enemies of change rear their head. And the first one is your friend and mine, status quo. People do not naturally change. Matter of fact, people don't change typically unless there's a profound reason to do so. Uh, if I'm 50 pounds overweight and I can't walk upstairs and my heart is beating when I'm watching television, I've got to do something. Or my physician says, you better get in shape. There's got to be some real pain message that's sent. And part of the challenge, I know Father Evan again, I'm sorry for singling out so much Father Evan, but it was just a wonderful presentation last night. But part of the challenge behind that is to say, you know, am I looking, am I aware, am I challenging myself, and am I being honest with myself that my parish, or are your parish council members saying, our parish is struggling? We're 50 pounds overweight, we better do something right now. There's something called the liminal stage. The liminal stage is when you're at a portal about to go forward and you have no idea where you're going. Those people, again, use the metaphor of weight. I gotta lose weight, now what do I do? And I don't know what to do. 
I've got to uh, redirect my parish council. I know we need to do it, but I don't know what to do. I know that we have some dysfunction in the parish. We have families that aren't talking to other families. What do I do? That liminal stage is one to say, I know I need to do something, and it's a period of disorientation for a leader. And it's really hard to lead when you don't know where you're going. And at that point, if you're in that stage, you have to fall back to what your core values are. But here's the challenge. Unless you've articulated those values, you don't know what to draw back to. You begin to wander and flop around a little bit. So the challenge behind this is to know where you're going, know how you're going to get there. Easier said than done. It's like me saying, go out and lose some weight. But status quo will fight you at every step of the way. The challenge on status quo, and I'm sure you have some parishioners, I'm not meaning to demean these individuals, that the memories of yesterday are stronger than the possibilities of the future. Do you have any parishioners that talk about the good old days? I got to believe you do, right? Even in a new parish, if you go back three or four years, remember when we were in the high school gym? That was really nice, you know? You know? Remember when, you know, we had the stairway we had to walk up? Remember we'd have to carry the icons up every Sunday? Now, while that was going on, they didn't enjoy doing that. But now it's a, a fond memory of, look what we did, right? We formed this church. Um, that's a challenge, because people want to go back to that. People want to go back to their old behaviors because it's comfortable. Have any of you been involved in moving a church, relocating a church? Very difficult, because my yaya and papu started this church. I was married in this church. My kids were baptized in this church. The fact that it's, you know, in a demographic area that's eroding every day and our walls are falling in, we're going we're gonna to ride this into the sunset. Was that really what we're supposed to do? So the challenge for a priest then is to move people through the status quo. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of perseverance from the leaders. But status quo is not alone. Not alone. Status quo's got buddies. Ken Blanchard of the One Minute Manager fame is, uh, now I'm dating myself, how many of you actually remember and read the One Minute Manager? Okay, so when I was younger there was this book. Oh, wait a minute, they had books. And, uh, <laughs> And one of them was a one-minute manager, and basically it was a, a primer of, you know, here's what good management leadership is. All right. Uh, easy read. You could do it uh, in the airplane. You know, after they spun the props, you know, <laughs> we'd take off, and then, uh, yeah. But Ken Blanchard's a very devout Christian, and actually does uh, all of his work now is in uh, Christian ministry, now as a uh, church consulting organization. Uh, I love Ken's definition of ego. It's edging God out. How many of you in your parishes encounter a situation where you're talking about a remodel, a new program, and you're met with, here's what I think, as opposed to, here's what we need to pray on that the Holy Spirit will guide us. And the challenge with change is that individuals look at these things and perceive these things from their own paradigm. And when you have a parish of 300 people, you quite possibly have 300 different opinions. Probably don't, probably overstated. But the reality is, is that you have to create this vision, as I said, and change, and draw people toward that vision. If you don't, you're going to stay right at this stage. You will not move beyond this. Oh, there's one other buddy. And that's the frame of reference. I mentioned the uh, 300 points of view. 300 people, when you announce a change, are going to apply their own perspective to this. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to apply their own definition unless you give a definition to them. For example, one parish is planning to move about 20 miles away. What's the first thing that someone's going to think about? What's my commute? Right? And you're going to set up winners and losers. If the church is near me, yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea. 
if the church is the other side of town, I think this is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. Right? And they're both sitting in the same room and a meeting just like this. We like them to vote a general assembly. The other thing, too, is they're going to look at history. As I mentioned before, is the, is the past stronger than the future? And they're going to talk about, have you ever heard this? Oh, we've done that before. Yeah, that didn't work. Right? Oh, Father, come on. You know, before you came here, before that priest came here, and before that priest came here, they've all said the same thing. It's not going to work, Father. And you have two choices. To show them you're better than your three predecessors, or to learn from them and find out what went wrong, or find out where they're coming from. That takes time. But I said earlier, time is an enemy. Because the key on change is you want to move swiftly. You want to build momentum. Mass times velocity. Build a mass of people moving quickly. That's what creates change. The longer you sit, the less momentum you have, and the harder it is to begin to spin that wheel. Requirements, expectations, What's it mean for me? What does it mean for the parish? Why are we doing this? What's the meaning? All these things. And I've talked about big change, but there's little change as well. Have any of you ever tried to, and I'll, I'll share a story that was shared with me yesterday here, uh, that one of the priests in the room, I did not ask him for his approval, uh, so I won't mention him by name. Uh, but uh, he mentioned that he moved uh, the candle stand in the narthex a couple of inches. <laughs> oh, Father, hi. <laughs> and uh, was met with uh, s significant resistance. Why is that important? I don't know. But it was to that person or those people. I don't know the full story. But sometimes they're just small little changes. And again, being aware of these things is extremely important. Now, we can project ourselves onto the situation and say, that isn't important. What well, is it that person? So again, there's techniques to manage that as well we're talking about. Well, they have one more ally in this, I'm sorry. Culture. <clears throat> Culture is what we know to be true. We can't really explain it, but it's what we do. We have a men's Bible study that starts at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. It's been doing that for years. Nobody in that room can explain why it started at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. Why did it? Because the organizer had a work schedule that enabled him to do it on that day. And that's why it was Tuesday at 9 o'clock. They were looking for some, you know, magical reason why it was Tuesday at 9 o'clock. That became part of the structure of the parish. Tuesday, 9 a.m., men's group. Doesn't move. There are no, I, you can go through, there are a number, a number of symbols and rituals and activities that have nothing to do with worship in your parish. And nobody can explain why you do it. It's just that we do it. You know, one of the uh, fun little stories, now, I'm a convert. Actually, that's probably wrong. Um, I'm cradle orthodox. Just took me 21 years to crawl up into the baptismal font. Uh, so I was baptized at 21 uh, through the wonderful uh, guidance of my then girlfriend and now wife Eve uh, 46 years ago. And um, when I came to the church, um, First of all, she was masterful in the way that she introduced me to the church, but that's, you know, last row, last 15 minutes, you know, so a couple years later, it's the second row for the entire service, <laughs> those sort of things. Uh, so she led me along uh, very slowly, which is wonderful. Uh, but it was very important that I understood, and she was very cognizant of exposing me to not the ethnicity, but just the culture of a church and, and how that works together and what that means. And it was, uh, you know, somebody coming in from the outside that had ever been exposed to that is extremely important to, to try to understand that. Um, from a cultural perspective, again, these are the things that bind us together. So the, the story I use, being a convert, is I, and you may have heard stories like this. In my case, this was absolutely true. 
My grandmother, it wasn't Yaya, it was grandma, because you know, I'm, not, I'm a convert. So she would make um, meatloaf. She's from the Midwest. I guess we're in the Midwest, aren't we? So she's from this area, Indiana, actually. And we always had meatloaf. So uh, my daughter got to know her a little bit, and she wanted the recipe. So she got the recipe, and it was a little bit more than a little bit of spice and boiling water that was shared previously for Avoca Lemon Soup. And so uh, my daughter said, you know, blah, 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 you put it in two pans, and you put it in. So we were at dinner one night, and Grandma's there, and my daughter's son, actually, said, Mom, why do you put it in two pans? The meal is only this big. She goes, well, that's just the way we do it. Yeah, but why two pans? She says, oh, I don't know, maybe it sears better at the ends. I'm not really sure. She says, okay. So at dinner, uh, and by the way, this is the way that I grew up for 40 some years eating meatloaf, was always in two pans on, on the dinner table. <laughs> not that we ate a lot of meatloaf, but that's beside the point. So my grandson says to his grandmother, uh, Grandma, why do we have, uh, great grandma actually, why do we have two pans of meatloaf? She says, oh, that's simple. She says, when I first learned how to make it, my oven was too big, so I had to put it in two pans so it would fit inside the oven. <laughs> okay. So when she was teaching her family, it was always in two pans. That's culture, right? We had adopted a structure that really made no sense other than the oven was too small. And that's what we are, had known to be true. So culture is what you know to be true. It's how you operate. It's the unseen binding in a parish. It's the customs, the traditions. And we form management structures around this to enhance that and secure that. One of those profound meetings I was ever at and this was nothing but the Holy Spirit guiding us, it was a parish council meeting at St. Paul's. And I apologize, I'm not trying to be boastful, I just, this was a very important uh, point in my leadership life inside the church. About eight years ago, we had a parish council meeting. I'd been parish council president quite a few times by that time, and we didn't have much turnover in the parish council. If you were up for re-election, you usually ran for re-election. And so we were in the meeting, and I thought, you know, we know each other, but we really don't know each other. It was a January meeting, so it's usually pretty full on the agenda, talking about the programs for the following year, et cetera, et cetera. And during the course of that meeting, I thought, you know what, at the beginning of the meeting, I'm just going to start, we're going to go reintroduce ourselves. And everybody kind of looked at me like, well, we all know each other. I said, no, let's just kind of talk three, you know, the classic, you have three minutes. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I selected Ron. Ron can't say hello in less than 10. I went, oh, no. Okay, Ron, go ahead. And Ron talked about, not about his career. We knew he's married. We know his kids' names. But he talked about how he became an Orthodox Christian. He was raised Catholic and how God was important in his life, helping him through his cancer treatments. And he took about 10 minutes. There was not an eye that was taken off of him the entire time he spoke. And basically he witnessed how important God is in his life. And then went to the next person. And maybe that person took a cue, but then he talked about the importance of God and some of the struggles in his life. And then went to the next person, and the next person, and the next person. Fifteen members of the parish council, after it got to be about number seven, I just took the agenda and pushed it to the side. Because there's nothing more that we could have done at that point as a team, as Christians loving one another, is to witness together. And you could almost hear the group pull together. Because we were pulled together in Christ, we weren't pulled together around the financial statement. We weren't pulled together around the church calendar. We were pulled together around Christ. Did that have a very profound impact that we saw that and drove our behaviors? We solidified our culture as a team. We already knew that we were acting this way, 
but we solidified ourselves as a team. And it was nothing but the Holy Spirit guiding this process. And thank God I, I had the wisdom that was granted upon me to push the agenda to this side and say, let's just continue. Most impactful, powerful situation I've ever been in with a, team, a group of people that I love on the parish council. We have culture. We love one another. As a leader of change, here's what the best do in the area of leading change. If you're gonna go out and lead change in your parish, here's what your brothers and sisters in Christ have done. And it's been my absolute honor to compile this list after witnessing and watching wonderful people lead change in their parish. Now again, when I say leading change, it could be as simple as changing a date or as complex as moving the entire parish. First of all, an unwavering trust in God, praying that he will guide our efforts. We push our egos, we control our egos, and we open our minds and hearts. Visible, energetic, and inspiring clergy leadership. That's many of you. You've got to create that vision. You've got to draw people to that vision. You have to defend that vision sometimes, but you have to be inspiring. You've got to sell the, the, the benefits of it, if you will. It isn't just, this is what we're doing, and follow me blindly. Yes, that happens in, in some of the cases, but people want to know. They want to get behind it. Because those leaders in your parish, those individuals in your parish, are going to go out because of your modeling and do it with their friends as well. There's got to be collaboration and participation throughout the parish. It isn't just one person pushing it. An unwavering and visible support from the parish council and ministry leaders. And not just seven out of the 15 parish council members, every parish council member. If there's somebody that's distract, uh, detracting, go to that person. Understand their perspectives. A deep, a deep respect and appreciation for all prisoners. You know, we can talk about status quo, we can talk about resistance, but we also have to appreciate where they're coming from and respect them. Superb communication. Tell them, tell them again, Tell them again. As a matter of fact, tell them until they say, okay, we've got it. And then tell them one more time. <laughs> and organize an effective plan. You know, <clears throat> look at number nine here in stellar project management. <clears throat> when anyone is working with an organization, there's almost an unreasonable expectation that that organization they're working with, especially for a nonprofit, has their, has their act together that they really know what's going on, and they are absolutely stellar in project management. And it's pretty unforgiving. How many of you have ever gotten a statement from the church office year-end giving that was incorrect? I have. And the first thing I think about, of course, a little different because I, I know all the people, but it's not, they're not supposed to be making mistakes because I'm giving them my money and they're supposed to be correct. So it's almost an unrealistic expectation that the whole thing is going to work out very well. If it doesn't, be honest and go back and tell them. Uh, leaders point to the progress. We're making these steps. They're encouraging. They're managing the resistance, but they're pointing to the progress. They're building confidence in the leadership. And then you listen. You listen, you revise, and you respond. No one's perfect. There's one person I've ever come into contact with in the business world or church world that can say, here's exactly what's going to happen in this project, and in exactly two years, here's exactly what it's going to look like. Nobody's that smart. Nobody is that good in predictions. They can get close, but we learn along the way and pray unceasingly. Pray unceasingly for guidance, for strength, for courage to lead the change. That's what you do. That's what I asked Metropolitan Yasimos to do, and he did it. He was willing to do it. He took a leap of faith and trusted me. So whatever we talk about, this is the core of what you have to do and a key step in getting to parish health is to be the effective leader of the journey. Let's get into some more details on the topic. One of the things I always do is build the context. In the context of change, 
is around the church, obviously. And I use this definition of Father, provided by Father Thomas Hopko. You know, the church is a liturgical worship and spiritual life. That's why it's there. It provides education and enlightenment. It's a center for mission and philanthropy. And because it's a church, it has structure and administration. You have to pay the bills. You have to pay for what you're using. One of the uh, models that I use to demonstrate this is a simple apple. At the core of the apple is the heart of what we do. It's our theology. It's our ethos. It's the why. You've probably heard that many times. You always start with the why. Well, the why for us is this. It's the core. And the apple grows out from those seeds. And what happens sometimes in ministry is we disconnect from the core. And the ministry, the program, takes on a life of its own. But it's contained within an apple, it can't break away. It's got to grow from. If it's not growing from, then it dies. And an apple that has bruises and is dying begins to decay. So we want to make sure that we are constantly looking at every one of our ministries and saying, is this growing from the inside out? And then we have that wrapping, the skin of the apple, that binds it and holds it tight. The inside of that you can't even see is the culture. And that's the effect of culture. It binds everything together. And what's the one way, the only way you can get to the inside of an apple? Anybody? You bite it. You pierce it. it takes energy. It takes power. And that's what you have to do in a parish. You've got to pierce that culture. I don't mean negatively. I, mean, I don't mean punitively. But with energy and focus. The skin of the apple represents us to the community. Who are we? How are we viewed? How integrated are we? A big mistake parishes make is they, they judge the sweetness by the size of the apple. There are very lovely, sweet, beautiful, small apples out there. And there are some big, large apples that have no flavor. Question from a strategic standpoint is what do you want to be? You want to be that small, flavorful apple that knows what it is? Or do you want to be a really big apple with no flavor and no nutrients? That's strategic thinking. Now, it's all the same. It's all wrapped with the culture. But you know, this culture, there's green apples, there's red apples, you know, all the kinds of apples there are. They're all in the apple family, but they all have a different flavor, different look, and different feel, as you are parishes many times. Our parishes, fundamentally, this is the body of our parishes. I could go into 85% of the parishes out there, if not more, and this is going to be a fundamental model that you're going to see in the parishes. On the outer border, we wrap it with the skin. It's our mission, vision, and values. What's important to us? What drives us? We have our culture that binds us, as I mentioned. We have leadership that guides us. And we have the why, the theology, the ethos that directs our activities and our worship. And within that, there are a number of ministries, programs, services, systems that all need, like the core of the apple, need to emanate from the core, not going into the core. It's a one-way street. So when we do a strategic plan, we look at every one of these elements, and we look at it and challenge ourselves. But the most important thing is to understand this. When you're looking at change and progress, you have to apply this notion as well from 1 Corinthians. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So there should be no division in the body, but those parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. One part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So many times, ministry leaders become siloed. They lose the big picture. The youth director doesn't understand how that could impact religious education in Sunday school. Parish council doesn't understand how some of their actions could be offsetting to full up to host, or vice versa. Ministry leaders within the parish have to have the broader picture to understand the context that their decision is not in isolation, 
but it is part of the body. And if a ministry, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is successful, whatever that means, then the body entirely rejoices. Parish councils, I think it's given that they have this viewpoint. We need to make sure all the parishioners do as well. And this is where you get division sometimes and competition. We want to make sure as leaders we avoid that. Okay, so let's talk about, we're going to go down. Those are the broad comments I made. I said we we're going to talk about. Now we're going to start to whittle it down in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about metrics and measures and how all that plays into this, I'm going to talk about three areas. And the first one is intentionality. Second one is success. And the third one is value. So we talk about metrics and measures in your parish. These are three concepts that can apply. Let me touch on these very quickly. First one is intentionality. In leading change, in using metrics to the benefit of the parish, the first step is to ask, what is my intent? As Holy Trinity, their intent was to improve transparency and trust, and they did a survey. That was their action. I have some examples here. Our intent is to bring clarity of direction. How do we do that? We establish a parish vision. If my intent is to improve focus and alignment between the ministries, I will establish goals, we will establish goals and actions for the parish. If our intent is to fuel momentum, we're going to deliver programs that we're going to tell people. We're going to point to our, our progress. And the list of intentions can go on and on and on. If you go and, and look at uh, Christian websites and look at Christian consultants, intentionality is a big term that's used these days. Everything is about intentions. It's been around for a long time. We used to call it, what's your purpose? What's your goal? But we have limited resources of time and treasures, and sometimes talent. So we have to be very intentional about what we want to do in our parishes. If we go chasing too much, we're not going to get anything done, because we're going to have points of resistance pushing back on all those points. If you can go out and do one thing well, and that will help the parish get healthier, then go do one, that one thing. It isn't the size of your project list that makes an impact. It's how well you're able to take that one intentional item. Now, how do you determine what that intentional item is? Well, you talk to people. You bring them in. You have an idea. You don't have to do a full strategic plan. Listen. That's one of the attributes of a good change leader. You listen. Ask people their opinions. So in, intentional not accidental. The other thing about intentionality, you've probably all heard this in your lives, what gets measured gets done. If I'm going to make a comment and set a direction, I'm going to measure that. If I'm not willing to measure that, then don't do it. At St. Paul's, we use the notion to say, we, say, we said we did. We said we did. So at every General Assembly, we will go and say, here, are our, here are what our priorities were or are for 2020 or 2019. Here's what we said we were going to do, and here's what we did. Whether you hit all of them or not, that's really not the point. It's the fact that you reported against it and were honest and said, here's what happened. Because, you know, people, will, people can take disappointing information. But it's really for them, difficult for them to take no information. Because if there's no information, what happens? They'll fill in the blanks. Right? They'll come up with their own ideas of what happened. And you want to eliminate that as well. So this notion of we said, we did, we've been doing that for many, many years. And it's just a point of honesty and openness to say, you know, because that program, those services, it's not Steve's. It's not the parish council's. It's not another parish council from another parish. It's the parishes. It's their stewardship which enables these programs to happen. And we are just there to manage the resources that they've been bringing forward. Next area is health. So here's a question for you. Is your health successful? What kind of question is that? That must be a typo, right? No, is your health successful? Has anybody ever been asked that question? Probably not. 
No, it's, it's a dumb question. Because health is not an endpoint. So when we talk about parish health, very difficult to use this notion of success. <coughs> success is typically, first of all, typically is not used in church life, other than what's the one question that's typically asked, was it successful? The festival, right? We had a successful festival. Why? Because it had a definitive beginning and a definitive end. And programs that have a beginning and an end that are very definitive are more likely to say it was successful. We had this event. Was this event successful? I don't know. We had a lot of people here. We had some good presentations. Was it successful? It was successful if you take what's shared with you and apply it. Now, I do leadership development. I've done it for many years in my corporate life as well. And the first thing I would say as a head of leadership development, we're not going to do a program for program's sake. Because that's just a waste of time. We're going to do a program to make an impact. And if we can't show the return, then don't do it. Don't waste people's time. So this notion of, is your health successful, doesn't work. It's typically, it's a transaction-based request. I mentioned our transactions earlier. What was our stewardship dollars? What was our stewardship campaign? Did the numbers go up? What's our capital campaign? Was our capital campaign successful? Well, we had enough money to build the building, so I guess you could say yes. Transformational change is a journey. Transformational change never ends. Transformational change is going to the heart. You're constantly looking at your health. If my gallbladder is not working, my whole body is not happy. I can fix my blood pressure and say I was successful with that, but I can't say my body is now successful. So very important when you're thinking about success and using that term. As a matter of fact, it's a term that, that I actually never use in, in parish life. But if you are going to be putting together a plan, I mentioned that a change program needs a plan in place. This is the type of plan that you'd put. This is an extract from uh, St. Basil Greek Orthodox Church in Stockton, California. And they completed their strategic plan. And I just want to draw attention to the elements of this. That when, it, when the plan is in place, and you can do this for, you don't need a strategic plan to do this. But every one of your programs should have an element of this. First of all, what's the objective? In this case, what is, this, what is the strategic objective? What are my goals that are going to support that objective? What are the things I'm going to do? So in this case, we're going to equip our leaders to be effective in their ministries, identifying areas of support, and developing future ministry leaders. That was their goal. By the way, this concept of emerging leaders is one of the top items that comes in across all parishes. Where are the next generation of leaders going to come from? And then we have goals. Let me see if I can actually read some of these from this distance. Conduct up to three ministry leader meetings a year. All right, that's a goal. The key actions, here's how we're going to do it. Here's the measure. How do we know when we're successful? And what's the timing of this? You probably have seen these called SMART goals. All right? Specific, measurable, attainable. The R sometimes is results, sometimes relevant. Seems to shift on the model that you use sometimes and time-based. But basically, when you put together your plan of health, you have to have a health plan in place. And you're going to be breaking that down to, I'm going to lower my blood pressure. I'm going to uh, you know, improve my heart, lower my heart rate. I'm going to X, Y, and Z. Do the same thing in your parish. OK? The next area is value. When you look at the metrics and the, ve and the measures, is what you're measuring valuable? We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of resources. So you have to ask yourself, that's a really good idea, but is it really valuable? Well, how do you know that? Well, unless you have objectives and a direction for your parish, you can't measure against that. 
So here's some of the things you should ask yourself when you're looking at a program. Does this impact a culture? Does this metric or measure improve accountability, transparency, and trust? Does that metric show that we're responsible stewards of the gifts given to us? A well-placed metric or measure will be complementary, not contradictory to a direction. Measures and metrics will create a very clear picture of reality and direction. This is what we're doing. And I'll show you some samples here in just a minute. It's intentional. It's mission and vision based. And bottom line, it's important to the parish, however that's defined. So as you're looking at measures and metrics, looking at the intentionality, what's it gonna do? Where are we going with it? Understanding, is it a transformational or transactional change? And what is the value to my parish? So there's three questions that you want to use when you're forming measures and metrics to determine. Now I mentioned again, we're now we're getting a little bit more detailed. When you go out and begin to collect data, ask yourself these three questions. What do I want to measure? How will I collect it? And what will I do with it? Have those in mind before you start. Let's look at the first one. What do you want to measure? Well, as I mentioned, there's transactional and transformational. Transactional are typically around ministries and programs. It's attendance on Sunday, it's the number of stewards, it's the number of children in Sunday school, year-over-year -year growth, uh, festival income. Uh, again, referencing Father Evan last night, he was masterful in the ability to, to uh, share his statistics, if you will. Number of baptisms, Year over, uh, 20 plus percent year over year growth in stewardship, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He pointed, and forgive me for analyzing you, Father, but he pointed to progress that's being made in his church, in his parish. And if he's doing that on a regular basis to his parishioners, the confidence goes up and the enthusiasm is generated. So those are transactional measures. Again, please, you know, I'm not trying to say that a baptism is just a transaction. I'm not. But it, there are typically numbers based. So the transformational are more focused on mission, vision, and culture. I'm doing a strategic plan right now, as I mentioned, at Holy Trinity in Portland. And one of the things, we've got some transactional items in that strategic plan. But the number one thing that the team said is we have got to modify our culture. And then we identified what those areas were and again, it's around trust and transparency. That's why we sent out the survey. That's why we sent out the results. But if it's transformational, does your parish want to do the same thing? Do they want to improve their transparency and trust? Do they want to be more loving and kind? What do those look like? What are the behaviors associated with that? How do we encourage that? Everybody wants to be welcoming and friendly. What does that mean? Well, all these will have programs and elements to them. Set up a welcome table, train your welcome team, put a process in place of follow-up, you know, uh, evangelism. We all want to be evangelists. Orthodox in a parish don't know how to do this. They just don't. We know how to do outreach. We know how to do a soup kitchen. We know how to collect cl clothing but we don't do a really good job sitting with a neighbor and saying, let me tell you about Christ. Come visit my church. Matter of fact, one of our most devout members at St. Paul's said, I've got a real problem. She says, I've got a girlfriend who's Catholic, and I know she wants to be Orthodox, but I don't know how to ask her because I don't want to foul up our relationship. Because if she comes here and doesn't like it, now what do I do? So what has she done? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because she don't, doesn't want to risk that. We don't know how to do this. But if you look at all the signals and the signs, and you look at that model that I showed you previously, we're seeing those signs and the statistics saying baptisms are down, death rates are up, mixed marriages are over the top. 
we better figure out something. Now, I'm not talking about business in terms of filling the pipeline, but we have to ask ourselves, do, are, do we want to be a small sweet apple or a large sweet apple? And it's just fine to be a small sweet apple if that's what fits your, fits your situation. So look at the types of measures that you're going to use. So festival profit, transactional or transformational? Attendance at a youth rally, transactional or transformational? <laughs> Becoming a welcoming parish, transactional or transformational? Transformational. Increasing trust. <laughs> and looking at our facility costs. I think I'm done, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got more. Uh, I'm on until 12, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Uh, Stacy couldn't talk, but I think his face said wrap it up, Steve. Um, Okay, so let me, I'm going to pick up the speed a little bit here because I've only had uh, another 40 more slides to go. Um, okay, 35. Uh, so how will you collect the data? Well, the, the classic nickels to noses, right? You count the money and you count the noses on Sunday. Just out of curiosity, how many of you do counts on a Sunday? Okay, all right, okay. Uh, there's also the quantitative and qualitative. Uh, quantitative is basically the numbers. The, uh, you, by the way, a survey, uh, if someone is a multiple choice question, that's a quantitative because you're putting a number to it. Qualitative are the open-ended questions on a survey, asking me what your opinion is on something. Um, very important to get a balance between the two. Uh, when you're collecting information, a little thing that I like to use, using the body metaphor again, is SOMA. Um, and there's four ways that you're going to collect data. Uh, S for statistics, uh, O for observation, M for a measure, meaning you're comparing yourself to something else, and then you're simply going to ask. SOMA, statistics, observation, measurement, and asking. Last night I had one of our priests here talk about his observation. And he said, you know, I know that uh, we were down in attendance on Sunday. I said, did you see the report? He goes, no, I just looked. Trust your observations. All right, let's talk about these real, real quickly. So by the numbers, statistics, a transactional piece. Uh, how many of you have a church management system, software in your, in your parish that, that runs this? And I'm not talking about QuickBooks, I'm talking about a real church management system. Uh, we have Effie Marie back here. Uh, she'll be more than happy to talk to you about church management systems at any time throughout this meeting. Is that correct? Um, so the Archdiocese does has, have a solution, the only orthodox solution that's out there. Uh, I will say in full transparency, St. Paul's does have another system. Sorry. Uh, but uh, our mistake, you know, we all have our mistakes and we get through it. Uh, but caution on church management systems. Uh, anyone that's done software implementations knows that it always takes longer to get the full functionality. Of it. So plan it, plan accordingly. It's going to take a little bit of time. But absolutely, uh, because we're in the digital age, having an effective church management system is, that can actually create good quality information is extremely important. There's clicker management. Clicker management is somebody standing at the door clicking people as they walk in. Uh, you can do it that way, or you can do, as a Catholic church uh, that I attended recently uh, for a wedding, uh, I was not even in my seat yet when I got a uh, push text message from the church that I was sitting in welcoming me to the church as a first-time member. It's like, wow, that is way cool. Wow, that is way invasive. <laughs> and that's really big brother. Um, but I was impressed that they did it. And, and if, would you like to know more about our church? And all I had to do is hit a reply, and I was into their system. That was, again. And then there's spreadsheets. Uh, they still work, too. You know, uh, hopefully you're not using just a calculator and a pencil. But uh, I think we're well beyond that. So that's your main source of by the numbers, is to have a really solid uh, church management system. Uh, observations. 
This is an actual quote from a priest. He says, Steve, every Sunday when I turn and face the congregation, I see my parish dying in front of my eyes. And I don't know what to do about it. He's at that liminal stage. Because what worked in the past is no longer working. And he's scared to death because he doesn't know what to do. But his observation is correct. Smaller observations. We need more chairs, holy apostles. We need more chairs in the church. We don't have enough room. We don't seem to have as many youth attending our activities as we did previously. Communion lines are getting really long. These observations are valid. They shouldn't be discounted as you're looking at measures and metrics. This quote from, uh, again, from Father Thomas Hopko, and a caution. So many times that we'll, we will look at observations or we'll look at numbers or metrics and draw a conclusion quickly. Better real darkness than false light, say the saints. Better real confusion than false clarity. Get other people to look at the situation with you. Don't assume anything. Comparisons. You've, been, you've done this. You meet somebody for the first time, maybe yesterday, maybe tonight. I'm from St. Paul's. First question I get is, how many parishioners do you have? How many stewards? The response is, well, by parishioners, you mean how many people on our email, our email list or how many people actually attend on a Sunday or how many stewards do we have? Well, let's pick stewards, columns B, okay. Well, you mean stewards that fill out a pledge card or contributors who don't fill out a pledge card? At that point, it's like, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're bigger than we are, have a nice day. Um, or how many students do you have in Sunday school? Or how large is your parish council? Or what are your stewardship dollars? Or what's your budget for the year? We put these points of comparison in. Well, I understand we're kind of calibrate, but here's a caution is that more times than not, comparisons of this manner tend to hurt. Let me jump ahead on the slide here. No, that's fine. They hurt because they can make you feel that you're failing. Make you feel that you're not as, you know, we, we judge so much on size. We need to understand that we don't compare in that way. The other thing from a comparison standpoint is look at trends, look at models, look at research that it's out there. Um, there are a number of, of statistics that were quoted the last, last night and, and some today on what's going on with orthodoxy. Um, Alexei Krindach has done some really marvelous studies. Look at those, see how they apply to your parish. Use them as a reference point. Use them as every Measure should be used as a learning opportunity, not a measurement to see how well we're doing or how bad we're doing. Um, Alexi's research there. Also, read books. Good to Great. Jim Collins has a really good companion piece to Good to Great, which is Good to Great in the Social Sector, and fundamentally it's churches, and talks about the difference between a business and a nonprofit or a church environment and looking at the metrics and measures that make it successful. He's identified five areas. It's about 60 pages, really easy read. Uh, you know, Tom Rayner has a website, and is, again, <laughs> last time, Father, I, I, I'm gonna mention, but uh, you know, look at non-Orthodox Christian resources out there. They're, they've got tremendous resources out there. I'm gonna tell you right now, the evangelicals and Protestants clean our clock when it comes to developing materials. Spend time also looking at our own archdiocese website. That's something that I don't do enough. We've got a lot of really good resources there. But if you, if you go out and you search leadership, healthy parishes, intentionality, revitalization, you're gonna see all kinds of material out there that can prompt some thinking in your parishes, and I really encourage you to do that. Now, you might get an a, uh, assessment on healthy parishes, and it'll talk about you know, the pastor skills, 
that don't apply necessarily to what our Orthodox priests do, uh, or other areas that have to be kind of, the terminology is going to have to be kind of crossfit into what we do. But it's pretty minor. For the most part, they apply very well. Uh, this autopsy on the, uh, of a deceased church was a book by Tom Rayner. And this is one that uh, I use when I go out to parishes as kind of a converse of, instead of looking at why parishes succeed, let's see why they die. And a very impactful little booklet, small little booklet as well as again. You know, Callahan's book on effective, way back when, one of the first books out there, he called it an effective parish. You can say healthy parish, and it's going to follow that. Uh, here it is, why comparisons hurt, uh, which I've always talked about. And the last one is ask. Simply ask. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but wise man listens to advice. Give as much input as you can. Simply ask questions. And I'm going to pick up speed here a little bit. Uh, we have health assessments, surveys, and discussion groups. I was going to have you take a health assessment, but I've decided not to do that for time's sake. But basically, it's going to look like this. Uh, anybody uh, want to take this real quick, read it? How's your score? Great. All right, let's move on. Uh, now, there's no absolute score on this. Uh, this is a derivative of the work's been done by a number of people. Um, the way I use this is, and I actually have handouts here that actually Stacy has. You can pick them up at the break. Uh, it's really simple to do, and you know you rate red, yellow, and green. You know, does it apply to our parish? Red, no. Yellow, kind of. Yes, we green. We do a good job. And you just put a numeric against it. One point for yellow, two points for, red, for green. And you get a total score. The score actually means nothing. But what it does mean is that there's a, comp a comparison point for when people sit down and they start looking at how they're doing. These people like scores, right? Now, what I mean it does mean nothing, that's not quite true. It has not been scientifically proven, OK? But the most important thing is if you have 12 people take this, if you have all your ministry leaders, if you have 25 ministry leaders take a survey like this, then you compile the results by each one of those 12 areas, you're going to be able to get a composition of what the parish looks like. That's when you become intentional about working on those areas. And that's how this is used. Give it to your parish councils, give it to your ministry leads, have them take it, you know, here's some little scoring that you could use. But the most important thing is what are each one of those categories looking like, and are we strong or weak in each one of those categories? Because all those categories, for the most part, are transformational, for the most part. OK. Uh, surveys uh, allows you to buy, you know, get a lot of input. Um, downside is they take a little more time. It could be a little more expense. Before you begin, you're going to ask yourself you know, all these questions. You know, how long should it take? Who's going to do it? What's the process? How are we going to collect the data? How are we going to disseminate the data? How are we going to analyze the data? And the biggest question is, are we going to do anything about what we find? And if you're not willing to act on it, then absolutely don't do a survey. Because there's an implied contract that if I take my time to fill out this survey, you're going to do something with it, not just report it. It's going to lead to change. And if you do that, the next time you want to do a survey, people are going to fill it out. One of the keys as well here is a deep respect. Father Eris one time shared with me that the role of a parish is not to shame anyone. A survey is not to shame anyone or any ministry. And people become so associated with their ministries, it's really hard to say our youth program stinks and not think that the youth director might take that a little personally. So it's really important that the administrator runs that really fine line about redacting information and being completely honest and truthful. But that's where the priorities come in. And is it more important to make sure that that one Christian is not <coughs> shamed in front of the parish with these results? Honestly, I've never encountered major issues, but I will warn all priests that if you do a survey, the number one person by name that's going to be in the survey will be you. 
because all leaders are. That comes with leadership. If you're the CEO, if you're the president, you'd all be named because that's what people look at. Okay? Don't take it personal. Well, depending on what the comments are. Um, okay. Uh, communications process. Uh, scope creep. We started with 40 questions. We ended up with 85. Uh, surveys won't get into the why. You know, you get a survey question that say, well, why, why do people have a hard time driving 22 miles? I don't know. Now let's go out and find them. So surveys, broad-based surveys for a parish are typically leading to follow-on questions and activities. Uh, discussion groups. Benefits are quick, low cost. High ownership, these people are sharing their ideas verbally. Um, it's great for uh, idea iteration. I have an idea, let me build on that. And they can be a lot of fun, too. Um, you have to, you need a, a very skilled facilitator to run these, uh, or at least a good facilitator, because one of the challenges is to control the loudest 10% that's in the room. Uh, if you're in discussion groups, that's one thing the facilitators are always cautioned on, is how do I control the 10%? And uh, sometimes, uh, well, you probably know a few Greeks in your communities that are a little bit loud or have an opinion. Anybody? No? Okay, well, it's, you're, you're unique. Um, anyway, I apologize for running through this very quickly. If you want more information on plans, any of the structure of SMART goals, uh, there is a booklet that you can download. Uh, this is the address. It's a strategic planning guide that was created as an offshoot of the uh, Metropolis of San Francisco's strategic plan. And um, uh, it's basically a step-by-step -step guide on how to create a parish strategic plan. And in it, talks about discussion groups, uh, survey uh, questions, those sort of things. And it can be a resource to you as well. <coughs> and then finally, what will you do with the information? You plan and you lead. A plan without leadership, is a nice plan. That's not going to do anything. Leadership without a plan is chaos. So the two of them need to run hand in hand. It's extremely important that as you're planning, you're looking at both elements of these. And finally, all this comes together in an annual planning process. If you're not doing an annual plan, if you're not doing a, a parish council or leadership retreat, I absolutely suggest that you do that. Once a year for a day, you need to get off site and off-site, not in the church, off-site, and have a very honest and open conversation with yourselves about how it's going. How is our health? How are we doing? Take an honest look and look at our programs, our ministries, and saying, are they effective? Do they need to be pruned? Do we need to create new ones? And build your plan from the bottom up. Looking at your mission, vision, and values, reviewing those annually, looking at the status of current strategic objectives. Do you have a current strategic plan in place? Are you delivering against that? Is that a live document or a dead document? Create and confirm planning principles. What do we believe in? How are we going to operate? How do we behave? And it goes on. We're going to create parish priorities and programs for the upcoming year. Then we're going to develop an annual calendar. Then we're going to incorporate the ministries and programs into that calendar. And it gets built from the bottom up. So many times a budget is, well, we added 3%. Okay? It's not linked to programs, not linked to services. We just added 3%. That's not a, that's not a budget. That's not an effective budget. And a budget enables things to happen. This is an example of 2020 priorities and programs. This is actually what we had at St. Paul's for this year. First statement is we're going to commit our work to God. Not placing worship and participation in the sacraments, but those are stated as very key elements, unshakable elements of whatever we do. And then we have programs and services and ministries below that. It's a statement that we share in our General Assembly. It's a statement that we incorporate into our budget to show where these are in the budget to show that we are going to be doing these things. We also have guiding principles, statements of belief of how we're going to operate as a team, 
how we're going to continue to love one another and have that as our dominant behavior. In our report card, I said we said we did. This is an actual slide from our General Assembly that said, here's our report card. And some of them have no, we didn't do it. And we explain why. So this notion of building a plan, having a direction, having a report card, holding ourselves accountable, sharing with the parish as stewards you gave, and here's how your gifts were used. All gifts to the glory of God, all gifts to his church. Last slide. Healthy behaviors create a healthy parish. A healthy parish creates healthy outcomes. First you create the behaviors, you create those good practices, those healthy practices, then you will see outcomes. And the beauty of this is once you have a healthy parish, they will create healthy outcomes and it will just continue to renew itself. But the first one is to start, know where you're going, know how you're gonna get there, pray unceasingly, and you'll get there. Thank you very much.